Great. Well, it's Friday, so you know that that means NMTF is going to try to do a little bit of education and advocacy. And uh, uh, but before I get too much, speaking of education and advocacy, I think we're only twenty days out to our uh, elections all across the country. And so, just make sure if you can early vote, go out and vote. And if you're voting on election day, vote election day, but make sure you vote. Uh, I saw a note the other day that election day is November 5th, not after, so make sure you do that. Um, but glad to have you all here today. Um, the today's panel, we're with our we're with Courtney. She's uh, going ahead and moderating, so you know we're talking about centering data equity. And in that case, we're centering data equity in the Black maternal health crisis. It's a public health imperative. As you all know, or probably know, I've seen... Uh, Courtney Lang, she's been working with NMQF for some time now. She is um, she has Lango Plus Partners is her organization. She's a uh, from she attended Pepperdine and Ohio State for law school. So she's a lawyer by training, and she's been doing a lot of public public health advocacy in her career. Um, I've had the pleasure of, like I said, knowing and working with her for years. She actually was our outstanding leader. She received our award at the this year's summit. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Courtney Lang. Thank you so much, Brandon, for the very generous introduction and welcome everyone. We are thrilled that you are here with us on this day. So to Brandon and the entire leadership team at the National Minority Quality Forum, with special gratitude to Dr. Gary Puckran for his unwavering commitment to data and to data equity for over 20 years, we owe you a huge Thank you, thank you, thank you. So greetings audience, and we are celebrating advocacy for data equity, always and with intentionality. And so today's webinar is no exception. Just a few housekeeping rules. If you would like to submit a question, we would be honored to have you submit those questions in the Q&A function on the Zoom screen to submit your questions to the panel. Again, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom screen. That will allow the panelists to be able to address your questions. We will leave time at the end of this session for Q&A. So today's webinar is recognizing the work of the Data Equity Coalition and is highlighting the mini issue brief produced by the Black Women's Health Imperative, Centering Data Equity in the Black Maternal Health Crisis, a Public Health Imperative, authored by Dr. Ifioma Yudo and Linda Goler Blunt. Our panelists will be presenting in the following order. Keisha Brooks Coley, Vice President, Advocacy, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Gretchen Wortman, Vice President of Policy and Programs, National Minority Quality Forum. Dr. Ifioma Yudo, Executive Vice President, Policy, Advocacy and Science. And Dr. Joya Creer Perry, founder and president of the National Birth Equity Collaborative. Our common denominator in this panel is the goal of making a difference. Representation always matters and improving standards for data where individuals can actually see themselves in the work is the impetus for our gathering here today. So without further ado, I am going to just show a few intro slides, and then I'm actually going to turn the floor over to our first presenter, Keisha Brooks Coley, momentarily. So thank you, Keisha. And I'm going to just start us off with our title and highlight for the audience to please access the QR code for the Data Equity Coalition. And Keisha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Courtney. Um, I appreciate that introduction. Uh, and thank you to, to Brandon and, of course, Dr. Punkrin uh, and the work that uh, we have been able to do on this important issue. Uh, and my colleague, uh, Gretchen Wortman, who you will hear from next, who um, I am in a position to be able to work on this uh, important issue with uh, alongside her, which has been um, um, really a, a, an amazing opportunity um, for me uh, with all of the work that NMQF has done uh, on this important issue. Um, as Courtney uh, mentioned, uh, 
I, Vice President of Advocacy with Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Uh, if you are not familiar with the association, we represent 33 independent Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies, which collectively provide health insurance coverage for 119 million people across every zip code in every state uh, in, in the country. Blue Cross Blue Shield Association uh, is committed to addressing the disparities that exist in our healthcare system. Uh, and as the insurer of one in three Americans, we feel like we have the opportunity and our responsibility to act and work with organizations who have been doing uh, this work for many, many, many years and many, many decades as, as um, it was noted for NMQF. Data leadership is a key component of Blue Cross Blue Shield Association's health equity strategy that we actually released in 2021. Uh, and specifically, uh, and why I'm, I'm here today for this important conversation with all of you, uh, a key pillar in that strategy is improving access to and, standardiz and, and standardizing data. Uh, the foundation of our data equity commitment, uh, really what we say all the time is, if we can't, we can't fix what we can't measure. So we have to make sure that we have the standards to be able to um, have the measures that we need that we know will lead to outcomes. Thanks for going to the next slide. So we have prioritized uh, standardizing data to advance the health equity movement. Uh, and with that work, we are developing and have recommended policy solutions that advocate for race, ethnicity, language, social, sexual orientation, and gender identification data standards, um, as we often refer to as SOGI, uh, and advancing health care um, equity and health outcomes. Next slide. So that's why BCBSA has partnered uh, with the National Minority Quality Forum and 21 other stakeholder groups who joined us last year when we actually stood up the coalition uh, and created the Data Equity Coalition. Uh, advancing policy recommendations through collective advocacy uh, to ensure equity in data uh, is, is represented. We, as a coalition, have been engaging with lawmakers and regulatory entities to prioritize data standards, uh, supporting the recently updated OMB Statistical Policy Directive Number 15, uh, and we'll be continuing uh, to work with the groups who are listed on the slide um, as they implement um, their agency action plans, uh, specifically working closely with the Department of Health and Human Services. So with that, I'm going to uh, pause uh, and hand it over to uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Gretchen Wardman. Gretchen, Thank you. welcome. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I, had to, I had to unmute myself. The, uh, uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Keisha, for the kind words. Uh, I, too, have um, been honored to have this opportunity to work with Blue Cross Blue Shield Association as they step forward to take leadership uh, on this conversation about uh, inclusiveness in the data. Uh, it's not always a role we see in the insurer uh, world. And I think the, uh, um, so the forward looking view uh, and the courage needs to be uh, acknowledged. Uh, and I also want to sort of uh, linking back to uh, uh, Brandon Garrett's opening remarks, uh, we do um, sponsor these Friday webinars um, in the interest of education and advocacy. And I will say that that means that I too always have an opportunity to learn and grow. And one of the uh, I come out of an English literature background, so I do tend to try to create uh, inclusive narratives as uh, I move forward. And uh, one of the things I've done this week, and I hope it, it it's not uh, um, uh, it, it's of it's informative for those in the audience, is step upstream from the concept of data equity and to remind myself again what the definition of health equity is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there are lots of definitions out there, uh, but I, I 
stopped at CDC and the um, definition they have online is the state in which of health equity is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. Mm. Which then again, then made me wonder what exactly, how are we defining fair and just? Mm. Okay, I know it links back uh, decades uh, uh, to the civil rights movement, but it occurred to me that I really didn't have a definition of it. And so as I uh, searched on that, Fair and just is defined as equal in every possible way. In, every, in which everyone is treated with the respect it says they deserve mm. and receive satisfaction related to what they are asking for. Mm. And I think it goes on to speak to within a, um, an acceptable moral context. And that triggered two things for me. One is um, that the health equity conversation is not a they conversation. If we're having conversations about health equity, it has to be a we conversation. It cannot be uh, fragmented or segmented with some of us looking externally to what their problem is yeah. those individuals, those population cohorts, those patient, um, th those particular patients with a diagnosis code, uh, which then I would hope enables more full-throated engagement on the creation of equity than we often see. And what is sometimes I feel considered to be an acceptable um, um, sort of strategic um, inclusion of individuals who are equity challenged Okay. through the lens of, and we hear it often, whether we can afford mm. yeah. to bring people into the conversation, whether it's more than our society can invest in. I submit that there is no challenge in equity that does not adversely affect those whose social determinants of health accrue to their benefit in the way society is structured. So that being the case, NMQF has um, not only for uh, several decades um, embraced equity in its fullest possible definition, but it's how we also find ourselves uh, devoting a significant percentage of our time and effort to assuring that the data, the data elements that are available uh, reflect the existence of individuals in this society in all their possible manifestations mm -hmm. in their intersectionality, which is how I'm defining equal in every possible way. We must have data that make us all visible. And so that brings us to today and um, this opportunity to address um, the Black maternal health crisis which I think Dr. Creer Perry and Dr. Udo both know means that we've got a maternal health crisis in this country that is uh, specifically manifest uh, in a particular population cohort, but it cannot be addressed out, out of context mm -hmm. of all of the quality of inputs to maternal health. Mm -hmm. um, so... We have, through the Data Equity Coalition, uh, created five different mini briefs. One was authored by the National Minority Quality Forum as what I'm thinking of sort of as a framework, a, uh, a foundational mini brief. It is not uh, a, a, a com comprehensive examination of all of the aspects, all of the challenges associated with data equity, but it was a place to start. 
-hmm. as a place to serve. And we have, uh, there are four other mini briefs, one of which we will be um, uh, through Dr. Udo's uh, presentation, uh, examining today and expanding upon that with Dr. Career Pair's extraordinary experience in uh, creating the National um, Birth Equity uh, Collective. So I will stop because that's more than I think Courtney expected me to say. And I think I'm supposed to kick this back to Courtney and say thank you so much. And I hope you all find this informative. Thank you, Gretchen. I think the, the emphasis on fair and just was critical. And so we are uh, delighted for that grounding. So without further ado, and we appreciate the, the co-conveners, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association and National Minority Quality Forum for assembling the Data Equity Coalition together. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Ifioma Yudo and uh, allow her the platform to provide some opening remarks and reflections. And then um, I will begin the, the Q&A uh, with her. Thank you so much. Thank Dr. you, Courtney. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone on this call. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, many thanks to the National Mi Minority Quality Forum for their leadership in this space. Um, I was completely honored to be asked to participate in this process um, because as with Gretchen's grounding that she just gave us around health equity, um, the other part of health equity that I think we need to be thinking about when we move into the conversation of black maternal health and maternal health as a whole is how we center joy in that process, right? Black women and health and our maternal health and bringing babies into the world um, should be a joyful process. And we live in a time right now where considering what the rates are of maternal death in this country um, and then comparative around the rates are for black women, that doesn't feel very joyful or just. Um, so I'm very appreciative to, this, to lift up the conversation around data equity and why data and understanding um, equity issues with regards to birth is incredibly important. The United mm -hmm. States out of developing countries in this world, our rank is 55th in, the mater in maternal health deaths. Um, that is atrocious. And black women deserve more than just, we all deserve a standard of care. See my, my, my child joining our call. Um, but we also deserve um, more than that. So thank you for the opportunity to reflect on that conversation. Absolutely. So let us begin with, with a grounding question on why is advancing data equity so critical to protecting, preserving, and transforming the outcomes for the Black maternal health crisis, Black and Brown women across the country, and some of the statistics that are, quite frankly, staggering and highly unacceptable in the U.S. So protect, reform, transform, why is advancing data equity so it's critical? Incredibly, incredibly important. Um, the rate of maternal health for maternal mortality for Black women in this country is higher than any other race across for black for black health. Um, maternal mortality in the United States in 2022 was at 49 deaths per 100,000. Um, we are two to three times likely to experience maternal death um, in the United States as compared to our white counterparts. Um, it's 16% 16, 16 for Hispanic women and 13% for Asian women. We are at 49.5% um, of, of a rate of death in this country. Wow. That's, that's, that's uh, uh, deplorable. Yeah. Um, and when we talk about that as a comparative whole, as I mentioned, the United States is last in the, in the world <laughs> for, maternal, for maternal health. And so... Luna Golder Brunt, my co-author and the CEO, President and CEO of BWHI, she has this really um, um, interesting and interesting way of saying this to us and her team at, at BWHI, which is um, 
we, we not only deserve the standard of care, we don't even actually want the standard of care because if the standard of care in this country still sets us at a country that is going to be at the last in the world, in developing world for maternal deaths, then why do we want that? Why do, why do, and why does anybody want that? And so being able to understand and seek data within that knowledge and experience, I think is really important, Courtney, to your point around understand and protect, because if yes. you place black women within that context, we are not being protected at all through the process of birth in this country. Um, and there are so yeah. many ways that we can address that and talk about what that means and talk about the policy recommendations. And I know that we'll get there, but I just, just that context alone is really important to understand. We don't want the standard of care. We want more than that. That's right. We all, we all deserve more than that. It, yeah. We deserve more than the minimum. Yes. We yes. deserve more than the minimum, which we can't separate the maternal health equity conversation from the birth equity conversation. And so with that framework and understanding how the ecosystem of maternal health evolves, I want to turn uh, the floor over to Dr. Joya Creer Perry, allow her platform to offer some opening reflections, and then I'll pose a question to you, and then we'll open up for broader dialogue. Oh, thank you so much, Courtney. Can y'all hear me okay? That Yeah, that's better. I was just going to ask all the panelists if you mm -hmm. could just augment just a little bit. Yeah. It'll help with the recording. And so, yes, to everyone in the audience, the recording will be made available by the National Minority Quality Forum. So I said, I've been on TV at, and on um, CNN and my son is in the background doing the robot. So I, I feel for you, my love, my co-panelist. <laughs> um, so I'm really... Gretchen really set the table for what I would like to say, because when we created the National Birth Equity Collaborative, there was no definition for birth equity. So we looked at all those definitions the same way that you did, Gretchen, and we found the CDC definition, CDC definition to be wholly un, un, unachievable, right? That's who, who decides what's fair. And this having an opportunity is also fraught with not having um, accountability. It's, it's similar to the language in the constitution that says the pursuit of happiness. Um, mm. So this opportunity and pursuit is a very much a, a, an oppressive language. So what I was, what we just la landed on is a mixture of a definition um, that comes from Kamara Jones, who I love and follow around everywhere. And, when it, when, <laughs> and so her definition of health equity talks about that it's uh, the assurances, um, to putting the assurances in place um, so that we can all thrive, basically. So it's the opposite. The onus is no longer on just having an opportunity or having fairness, but really our role and what you do at MQF and have done and what Gary has done and what we do at Black Women's Health Imperative and all of us, we put the assurances. So that's policy's big P. So we are around here trying to make sure that the government actually counts data like it's supposed to, that physicians are held accountable for their behaviors, right? So the assurances really require some level of accountability. And I would offer that that word in and of itself um, changes everything that how we think about equity. It makes us do the work that we're doing very differently than just saying you have the opportunity to be healthy. No, it is our obligation to assure that you are healthy. It is our role, even if as an individual. So as, as an OBGYN, I have to use whatever power I have at that moment um, to make sure that my patient is healthy. If I'm a part of a larger system, like a managed Medicaid organization, then it is my job to assure, not just give the opportunity for the people who I'm getting billions of dollars to care for, but if I'm getting money and I'm a Fortune 200, see, I have a little thing about that. I'm a Fortune 200 company off of Medicaid dollars. I should be doing the assurances for Black maternal health. We should not still be dying once we're paying all these insurance companies to ensure that people are um, having health. So really, once we can all agree that it's not our job just to say um, equity does not mean I give you opportunity, but equity means I'm responsible for your health, that your your life is tied to mine, your future is tied to my future. It allows for us to um, build a better world together because truthfully, we're all dying from inequities. It's not to work to the other point. And um, it's not just it's just not one group of people. There are white people dying in the United States who, if they lived in Norway or Switzerland, they would live. And the reason they are dying is because we devalue people based upon race, based upon gender, based upon geography. So racism is killing all of us. Inequities are killing all of us. So it's going to take all of us to change for us to be able to thrive. Thank you so much for that. And I, I wanted to kind of build off of your opening reflection 
to kind of pivot a little bit into intersectionality. There was a great framework in our opening about the work around race, ethnicity, language, sexual orientation, and gender identification. And we want to really understand within the birth equity movement, yes. why is intersectionality and addressing that so important to how we find solutions to and really addressing inequities in care? Yes, thank you, Courtney. I'm sorry to cut you off. No, okay. <laughs> so it's really also the reason that I think when people see the Black maternal health outcomes out, um, that are so bad that people pay attention, because what intersectionality does is that it makes you see both race and gender come together. So Black maternal, the reason Black maternal health is so bad is because you have the oppressions from racism plus the oppressions of being a woman put together into one outcome versus a lot of times, you know, if it's um, things like diabetes or other illnesses, you'll it kind of goes back and forth. So you see the pure, the purity of the devaluation of black mothering, of black parenting, of black women, and I woman, we could go back, right? So um, technically when Kimberly Crenshaw and the legal scholars start talking about intersectionality, they were trying to get black women who were working at a plant um, in Detroit to actually just get uh, access to the same things that white women and black men were getting. And so this idea came from, you can't just pick a certain minority and pick a, a one oppression and say, okay, well, we already got the black dudes and the white women. So you black women, y'all don't get anything. And her argument was not only should they have things, they have a double whammy. They are both, they have both the gender problem and the race problem. And so what that, how that shows up in birth equity is if we only focus on the fact that women are dying in childbirth, we will get to the rates that, that white women will do a lot better. So you'll see some things right now. Um, the number one reason for maternal death is, is mental health. But that's when you have when you include all white women, which we need to do, and we need to focus on mental health. But when you look at black women, it's more cardiovascular. So if we only spent the next 10 years only focusing on mental health, which is what we normally do in this country, and not focus on the thing that's killing black women, we will ignore cardiomyopathy. We will not fix the things that we're doing around um, hypertension. We will not fix preeclampsia. So there's just, if, the intersection of both race and, and then you add class language. We know that in New York City, um, or not just New York City, but I'm using New York City because they have the data that people who are um, Puerto Rican have worse uh, birth outcomes than their other counterparts in the Latinx community. So the newer immigrants, so immigration status. Uh, we know that after the Muslim ban under the previous administration that pe pe Muslims had, um, had higher risk of preterm birth. All right, so we have data to support that your language, your religion, your geography, actually um, the, it, it causes worse outcomes to you, not because you are Muslim or because you are Black, yeah. but because the, the way people treat you based upon those things causes you to have injury and harm and death. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to, to get perspective from both uh, Black Women's Health Imperative and the National Birth Equity Collaborative together because how we work in community and how we collaborate together ultimately determines how successful we are at amplifying the stories and giving visibility to the crisis. For sure. And we talk about the crisis, we hear about the crisis, but yeah. we might need to do more to amplify what this crisis really is. And so I was just gonna ask uh, if we can just split the screen between Dr. Udo and Dr. Creer Perry just to, to be able to have that response. So I was going to invite Dr. Udo back into, yeah, into the conversation. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. No, yeah. Go ahead. Pleasure. It's okay. such a pleasure to be here with Dr. Creer Perry, who is a master in this work of storytelling. And so to answer your question, Courtney, it's that, right? I, you know, those of us on this call and many of our colleagues who are listening in right now, lots mm -hmm. of public health people who are here, people who work across big P, little P, the one thing that we're really good at is being data geeks, right? Like I'm, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm an anthropologist and I love me a, a brief, I love some data, I love to like quote the facts, I love to do the research, but the rest of the world out there don't know half the words that I'm saying when I say these things, right? Um, and And so we have to get better, public health has never been, that's never been one of our strong suits is telling storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have to encourage storytellers. We have to encourage from, for example, the roots of BWHI founded by Billy Avery, the storyteller, the master storytellers of who we are as black women to amplify those voices. We have to get, get into the written word. Mm -hmm. We have to get into the arts and culture. We have to 
translate that data into policy and papers and science and all of the things that we try to get our lawmakers to understand. But the lawmakers also need to hear our voices and see us as part of the story that make up who they are charged with representing in the United States, right? That storytelling yeah. visual, I think, is incredibly important. I think those of us that work in this field are charged and tasked with trying to do that at our highest level, using mm -hmm. all the tools that we have, whether or not mm -hmm. they be science and data and geek geekness, or whether or not they be mm -hmm. the listening to women mm -hmm. as they come through the door. And yeah. what is it that they are saying to us? The providers that you have to you have to hear what women are saying when they come through your door. You have to hear what they're saying when they don't come through your door and why yes. they're not coming through your door. Let's yeah. talk about the difference of what happens between rural communities and urban communities where there are some states in this country that don't have providers within a 700 square mile reach. And so mm -hmm. how do we get their story into, into, the, into the process? How do we provide care in those places? How do we think about changing our health system? Systems based on what we know is really happening. And that's how that's why data equity is so important because data tells us stories. Data yep. tells us yes. stories. And so then what what do we do with those stories is what I think we are charged with in terms of our collaborative efforts and as organizations in this work. So and, and I love that. Also, I was gonna say so of course as the me, the yeah. storyteller, I have to tell the story that I met Linda at NMQF before she was at Black Women's Health Imperative, right? So like mm. our journey around mm -hmm. doing this work as black women because the personal is the political is the work when this is our lives like our we we cannot separate there's no um all of us have a um the reason i'm good at the storytelling truthfully is because it's the story of my existence and mm -hmm. i love that nmqf mm -hmm. has been a container for all of us to come together yeah. to meet to to grow and so when linda got the job at black women's health imperative we spent a lot of time intentionally working together about what is my gift versus hers we would go and have dinner and have lunch and think through like how do we ensure that my organization and her organization showed up in places and support each other when one was there and the other one wasn't there? What would we do differently? And honest, and that's how we've survived this long. <laughs> <Truthfully. Yes. Yes. laughs> because we take care of each other in the work because the work is also hard on our bodies, hard on our spirits, hard on our families. Yeah. I mean, we've been through things together, truth, personal things. Um, and so this is just, just, I don't want us to ever forget that our work is also personal and we're human beings and we're doing this work and supporting each other. So the data for us is not um, a theoretical data equity. Yeah. Like mm. we, I, I have a daughter who's currently pregnant. So the data equity is real for me, right? Um, yes. they, she's living in Texas. Like this is a whole other, sure. Dr. Joya is like, y'all all pray for Dr. Joya's nerves for the next six months. <laughs> so yes. that, but that, that storytelling, and because what we can do is make the data come to life. So yes. when you think about, um, kind of you know the nerdy geeky we like we like the the um the the, the data but people hear story so when yeah. you can take the data and put it into a story you get more reach and you get more people that way I keep and I wanted to, my no 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 I love that because what you both did was to um, contextualize the data I also want the audience to have some perspective about your work with the term birthing persons Mm -hmm. and understanding intersectional identification there within that that context as it relates to research for yeah. sure the audience for national minority equality forum is is very much grounded in the research for sure so is our research focus appropriate are we hitting the mark where do we need to go and how can that research help to advance data equity for birthing persons well, I feel like Dr. Uda can be more concrete. So I'm going to give you the story around the birthing person. And then, okay. okay. So um, when we started the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, um, that was really when the language was start. We were using the word mama. Um, and for some people that just didn't really hit for them. They didn't, and hit is not a very technical word. So they didn't feel comfortable um, with being um, called mama, mother. And we wanted to be really more inclusive with our language. We wanted to ensure that everyone felt seen. So we spent a lot of time doing listening sessions to figure out what was it about the word mama? Because if you're making an alliance and you want to talk about all black maternal health and death and life and joy, you want to make sure that the tent is big. And so we expanded our definition to include people who care for um, a child. So like if you are a grand, think about Shalon Irving and, uh, and Wanda Irving. If Wanda Irving, I'm sorry. To, so uh, Shalon was a PhD scientist who worked on um, 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 uh, inequities in health and who passed away about two weeks after giving birth in um, Atlanta. And her mother is now the caregiver for her child. So for us, if the mother had a heart attack because she was running around chasing this three-year-old, 
that counts as a black mama for us, right? So how we define black mamas. And so then we also had to talk to people about gender non um, making sure that we were using gender inclusive language. And so if, if the word birthing person doesn't, I mean, if the word mama doesn't feel comfortable for you, for whatever reason, birthing person fit for a lot of people. So we okay. were able to include, may have more inclusive language. We have a definition. It should still be on the Black Mamas Matter Alliance website, but we spent a lot of time intentionally working with community to get a definition that everyone could be seen. And that we can then move from there to your point around data, because yeah. if we only talked about a person who had a baby in a hospital, we're ignoring all the ways that Black people make family. If you are raising your nephew and he gets shot and you have a heart attack, where does that, where does that show up in public health? How yeah. does that work? Yeah. And we know Erica Garner was re was um was re reenacting her father's murder by the New York Police Department when she was only 28 years old and she died six months after his uh, murder. Um, and she had, I'm six months after having a baby from um, a cardiomyopathy. And so that changes all the things for me about understanding how because cardiomyopathy is something we understand as OBGYNs that is a consequence of pregnancy. And you we back when I trained a million years ago, it had about a 50 percent mortality rate. So the fact that this black woman was doing the trauma of trying to fight for her father who had been murdered by the police and reenacting his death and then died at 28 years old is not a coincidence. So if we cannot expand how we think about birthing people, the language, the, the six weeks doesn't make sense because she died six months later, like all of those things require us to reimagine and rethink how we talk about data birthing. and birthing. Yeah. birthing Dr. Guido, yeah. please. Yeah. I want to thank you for that, Dr. Kerr. I want to um, take it back to ma making a reference to the data, the data equity briefs, because yeah. the work of the coalition and the work that we've done with NM NMQF, uh, clearly one of the things that we advocated for in the update of the OMB 15, which, by the way, if people don't know what that is, please look it up. And if you have not seen the issue briefs, please look them up. There, there's five of them. They're really well done, and they're all centered on this issue of the OMB 15, which is a federal policy on how our um, census systems and our health systems collect data about us in the United States. And one of the things that we advocated for very strongly that we did not get back into the revision, which had not been done in over 30 years, we've been collecting the same kind of data in the United States in our medical systems and our census systems for 30 years. But one of the things that we really advocated for and we wrote about in the issue brief was this intersectional idea of we're talking about birthing people. We defined it in the brief and we named it as a, a necessary recommendation to the OMB updates because the OMB updates did not include measures and um, demographic measures for LGBTQ people. So that means in the United States, we are still not capturing to the best of our ability at a national standard who we are as a, as a demographic people, right? Mm -hmm. As a demographic people. Mm -hmm. And when we leave out things like LGBTQ populations out of our own internal demography, um, that, that'll tell you how problematic that is in terms of the missing data that we know we are not going to have about people okay. who are birthing people and who are necessarily the five within the gender, um, by, the, by, the binomial gender construct. Um, yes. We have to do better. Mm. And as researchers, we know that LGBTQ people also have intersectional um, 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 health health equity issues, yes. right? We know that there are intersectional health equity issues around HIV. We know that there are intersectional health issues around tra trans women, particularly Black trans women and the death of Black trans women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I want to take it back to this idea that, um, that, that Gretchen spoke about and Dr. Creer talked about why data equity is so important because it is the story of us. And if we mm. don't have the full complete story of us, how can we really get to what that quality of joy and justice means when we talk about Black birthing people? I love that, the story of us. And I want to make sure that both Keisha Brooks Coley and Gretchen Wortman join us in this dialogue here as we shift a little bit over into uh, a broader Q&A. We have a number of questions that have come in to uh, the panel from the audience. And so I want to honor that. And I'm so glad, uh, Dr. Udo, that you brought up 
Office of Management and Budget, Statistical Policy Directive number 15. Keisha, I might just ask if you could just give just a little bit more context for the audience on what OMB SPD 15 is and why, even though we touched on it in the opening, some people joined late. I have some direct uh, questions that came in just for a little bit more of clarity around the significance of that 30 year gap in time update. So I was gonna invite both you and Gretchen to this virtual table to respond. Yes, happy to. And uh, every time I think it's actually 33 years, exactly. Is it 33? Um, exactly. Which okay. Every time I hear that, 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 that number, it, it just um, amazes me that for 33 years, there wasn't a process or a conversation um, and a dialogue with, with um, stakeholders to talk about the categories. People felt like they were filling out forms and didn't see themselves in the forms. Um, all of the changes that were made that we know are, were so important um, and still more, more work that needs to be done. The standards that, um, so just to give a, 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 a 60 minute kind of high overview, um, the Office of Management and Budget was um, required uh, to have a process to update race ethnicity standards. Um, and that process uh, finalized in March with the update that we saw to categories and changes that were made. Um, they did go through a stakeholder process to be able to have that conversation. Um, and that is the first step. <laughs> um, and we were pleased um, you know, with the changes that were made, but there's definitely more work to be done. And the Department of Health and Human Services has to do an agency action plan that is due next year um, and has to be turned in that speaks to how they're going to do implementation for those changes across the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as other agencies. Um, and it will be extremely important that we continue to be a part of that process, the stakeholder community, to make sure that as they're doing uh, that work, uh, we are a partner. Um, our coalition, uh, again, was pleased with the race and ethnicity standards uh, that were that were promulgated, but um, started out on this on this path asking for federal standards for race, ethnicity, language, as well as sexual orientation, gender identity standards, SOGI data. Uh, and OMB was very clear they did not have the authority to do the other two, but that doesn't mean that we will not continue to have that conversation with HHS because the work that they are doing in their agency action plan is an implementation of what was included, um, but also making sure that um, there, they couldn't go further, but I'll, um, I'll pause there to see if Gretchen has something to add. Thanks. Thank you. And I think what I would add to that is that, uh, yes, we were pleased with the response we received from OMB, but we're not satisfied. And the, um, what was of particular interest to me when we had a recent conversation with some um, some of the leadership from the White House is that even if we had gotten everything we wanted from OMB, they don't have jurisdictional authority over all of the sectors in the United <laughs> States who need to engage on this issue. So there's, there's lots to look at as we uh, uh, look at creating visibility uh, for all of the individuals in this society, not just through the lens of, well, I'll say a visible uh, a sort of phenotype or, or visible um, characteristics. But as our science is moving into biomarkers, we need to make sure that we have uh, precision in the data that we're collecting so that as we move forward, we can assure that we are um, move forward in this uh, United States 21st uh -huh. century health yeah. equity movement that it is more inclusive than it has tended to be in the past. But I would I would also add to this that um, we have lots of conversations uh, in um, at the National Minority Equality Forum about concerns about rationing care. 
Huh. And uh, I think what we all know to be not oversight, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's intentional. Lots of smart people are making these decisions. Okay. Lots of well-informed people are making these decisions about how to structure staged access to the benefits of our society. And uh, at a minimum, I would say we have to continue to take steps to assure that we are collecting the data elements mm -hmm. that enable all of us and all of our intersectional manifestations to be visible when those of us who are paying attention to these issues yeah. come looking. Because if we don't, then we are by default rationing care. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. so I, I think in incorporating that into our thinking as we move forward is um, important. So thank you, Courtney. No, I, I like that. And uh, Dr. Udo and Claire Perry, I want to make sure that we address some of the questions that have come in um, specific to the work, to yep. the research, to the clinical, but building off of the framework that Keisha and Gretchen provided uh, with OMB SPD 15, that we're pleased and we're hopeful. Might not be satisfied, but we're hopeful. Mm -hmm. We're hopeful that that progress serves as promise for more to come tomorrow. And with that, there were a few questions about postpartum care, mm -hmm. postpartum care. And Keisha, some of that was related to the role that insurers and payers play in, in, in helping to support uh, birthing people. But if we could address perinatal and postpartum care, and why some of the data with those two cohorts of maternal health and birthing persons is important to address. If we could just touch on that just a little bit, Dr. Udo Creer Perry. And I'm going to defer to Dr. Gonna... Creer Perry on this. Yeah, this oh, yeah. Her, yeah. I have and thoughts, the... but this, this is her. This <laughs> and, is her. And, and unfortunately, I know way yes. too much about this. So, we... <laughs> so I'll, I'll be quick. Very I'll be quick. brief. Very but, brief. Um, six weeks was made up. Okay, there's yes. nothing biological about six weeks. Um, I have a theory that it's when women could have sex again. Maybe that's why they, I have no idea. Um, but so we know that we need to be collecting data for up to a year. So one of the big problems is no one, no one, we know that, but the general public, to your point earlier about OMB, Dr. Keisha, the, the general public doesn't know that. So if you go to an emergency room and mm -hmm. you had a baby two months ago, they're not asking you if you've had a baby. So th the entire infrastructure of how we even talk about postpartum um, is fraught because we have made up the six weeks. Yes. So that's a brief way to try to, um, and then we can get into, but it, it requires, and WHO, so also I just want to say, I don't, we cannot let people like OMB off the hook, and I appreciate you said we're not satisfied, because like, even though other people are, we don't, they don't control them, everybody listens to them. So mm -hmm. for us, WHO is why we have six weeks. So if we could get WHO off of the six weeks to a year, it'll have a trickle down effect to a lot of these other entities that WHO doesn't control, but people quote WHO when they're doing their work, so. Okay. Yeah, um, to build on that, um, I, I think the six weeks also has something to do with not just the physicalness of having sex again, I think it's, I think it's directly tied to our economy as well. It's the, it's the action of needing people to go back to work, right? And, and I think, again, when we talk about birth equity and particularly about women in the workplace and how a lot of us didn't, I mean, two day, I, my, my last day before I gave birth was two days before I gave birth, right? We work to the very end, come right back. But I think that's a whole nother. It is. And, 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 right? But yeah. I think one of the things that is also really important to pay attention to, and again, we made one of these recommendations in the brief, was um, this idea of national standards around pre and, pre and postpartum. I guess it should be at least 12 months. And um, in the United States, we have a national standard um, process called HEDIS measures. If you don't know what those are, if you work in public health, you probably should. I'm sure a lot of people on this call knows what they, know what they are. There are six domains around HEDIS. Um, so you can go online and look up what the six domains are. They're broken down in domains. But there is one HEDIS measure that is directly tied to maternal health. One, only one. And um, that, that domain is around um, postpartum visit to go visit your doctor between 7 and 84 days after birth. Now, there's all these intersectional domains that are accounted for with 
HRs and health systems as we know, um, like you know, tracking cardiovascular health, tracking other chronic diseases as part of birth. So there are ways to sort of cut and slice the data to get at what is happening, obviously, with the, the, birth, the birth crisis in this mm -hmm. country. But there's only one there's only one HEDIS measure. There's only one national standard, right? And, and it doesn't even really like because what do we do if a, if a visit it doesn't do anything? <laughs> so so I, I could have a whole talk about. So again, I think it's really important about how the leadership of organizations like Blue Cross Blue Shield have taken it on to sort of look at how these measures and how data equity work for those that yeah. they are um, insuring. Um, how other um, entities can look across their data health systems and create sort of collaboratives and learning processes around how to ensure that the data is working and being tracked and being used um, to support um, um, pre and post and okay. post health. I think all of those yeah. things are really important. So thank you. So as our time kind of draws to uh, a conclusion, I want to make sure that each of you have an opportunity to provide a final thought on one, just one recommendation, one recommendation, it could be policy uh, preferred because that there have been some policy questions that have come in on what is the action that advocates who are on this call can take to support data equity within the maternal and birth equity context? What is the one action that advocates can take? One action, very brief response so that everybody has an opportunity, and I will begin with you, Keisha. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. I would say um, with one action is just in continuing to influence the process, uh, continuing to make sure that we have one voice, and that's this is part where the coalition work becomes so important on what our asks are as a community as far as the standards uh, and what um, HHS will be putting forward in their agency action plan. Uh, so that's definitely one action that we will be focused on going into 2025. Excellent. Excellent. Dr. Creer Perry. Oh, I have to say the Momnibus. Momnibus 2024, we have to get it passed. We've been fighting for it. There is a lot of infrastructure in there that we could use, especially around data, funding for data, funding for how we could even talk about the data. And the, the bishops can't keep beating us, okay? The, we are bigger than the bishops. That's why they keep saying no to us, supposedly. I don't know why, why they say no, but we need to get the omnibus passed. <laughs> Agree with you there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dr. You know. I, yeah. I second that. So you, uh, Dr. Kerr uh, took, took mine, but we can share it and we all, and we're all <laughs> sharing it. Um, and I would, um, I would say that the Momnibus for sure at a federal level, but also to think about the down the ballot approach too around Momnibus. There are several states that have also put their own Momnibus acts in place mm -hmm. um, to, to support better birth outcomes in their own state, right? California has its own state Momnibus by Gavin Newsom three years ago. There are other states that are putting those actions in place. And so ensuring that it gets passed at that federal level, but to continue to advocate at your local levels as well. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Gretchen, please. Oh, thank you. I would say all of the above, as well as um, to take steps to see yourself as part of this conversation as affected by this conversation and ask questions about how your organization uh, is collecting and using data uh, to create uh, equity. Uh, and I'm sorry, it's three, Courtney. And uh, no, you're good. join with others, okay? Join the Data Equity Coalition if you are so inclined, if not, find others as uh, Dr. Creer Perry and um, Ms. Gola Blunt did, work together to create a united front to advance this conversation because it affects all of us at some point. And by the time you feel it, it's too late to change mm. it. Mm. Powerful. I took a few notes while you all were presenting. So for the audience, I'm just going to recap. Leading with the data was a key takeaway from today's conversation. Leading with the data and telling your story, capturing your story, sharing your story, giving visibility to your story, making sure that you're connecting the data to the stories that are being told, 
that we are charged and tasked with the responsibility for holding lawmakers accountable, charged and tasked, making sure that our lexicon is diverse and inclusive as possible, gender inclusive language, birthing persons, acknowledging our intersectional identity, that safe, quality, supportive, and concordant healthcare, safe, quality, supportive, and concordant healthcare are critical. We have the data equity briefs available on the Data Equity Coalition website. I've had a number of requests during this webinar to visualize the QR code again, so I'm actually gonna do that in a moment. But I want to acknowledge the courageous conversation that the women on this line have participated in. Um, we do owe a number of thank yous and to Blue Cross Blue Shield Association for being courageous in your commitment to community. Courageous in your commitment to community, led by Keisha Brooks Coley, we would not be here without your deep and dedicated commitment to data equity. And for that, and for the leadership of your CEO, Kim Keck, we stand in gratitude. So thank you. Thank you, Courtney. To, uh, Gretchen Wortman, National Minority Equality Forum, and Dr. Gary Puckran, who I acknowledged in the beginning, your platform stands in the gap for so many people, for women and for birthing people. And for that, we thank you. Dr. Joya Career Perry, National Birth Equity Collaborative, Dr. Ifeoma Yudo, Black Women's Health Imperative, and Linda Goller Blunt, your president and CEO. We are oceans of love and support for the work that you do each and every day in community. I want to share the screen so that the audience can have the QR code you can take a picture of the QR code and go to the Data Equity Coalition website. The mini briefs are available. The brief centering data equity in the Black maternal health crisis, a public health imperative, is available. And with that, we are concluding on time at the hour. So thank you so much, panelists, and to the National Minority Quality Forum for hosting us on this day. Be well and safe and tremendous advocates. Go vote. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.